All right, hello everyone. I'm Keith DeStone from the Center for Linux Studies, and this is the Cosmos Society online open house series of conversations. Our guest today is Dr. Jan Matsuyakabo. He teaches Greek history at Queen's University in Ontario, and his primary areas of focus are Greek epigraphy and religion. And Matt, you're co-editing currently a number of collections of Greek inscriptions. Some of them are online. Um, and today, today's conversation will be about the, let's see, relationship between narratives about the figure of Hermaphroditus and the social realities, let's say, in and around the towns, the ancient towns of Samakis and Halicarnassus. So um, thank you for accepting our invitation. And um, I'll turn it over to you and ask you as, you as you begin to tell us a bit, if you don't mind, about how you first came to study the ancient Greek world. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm delighted to be here to, to talk to all of you. Um, I started to study the ancient Greek world when my family moved to uh, Rome. I was still a, a teenager, basically finishing high school. Uh, I think in, in the education system in Canada, we don't have a lot of necessarily a lot of exposure to antiquity, but this, this move to Rome really transformed my life in, in many ways because the past is so present. You're you're so immersed in the in the past in a city like Rome. So I think this this experience was really the the turning point in my um, my development of a of a passion for classics. Uh, and since then, I've I've gone from there. Basically, uh, I was studying pre med basically in my undergraduate, but thinking that that classics would be an a nice complement to that, and eventually I, I, I focused almost exclusively on that. So that's uh, that's how yeah. things the ball Thank got you. rolling, basically. Yeah, I can only imagine moving to Rome, the effect that would have had. Thank you. Well, um, yeah, please go ahead, and um, we've tested the slides. My, so my screen. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, so thank you again. This will just be a, a relatively short presentation before, hopefully before we move to a more open discussion. But before beginning, I'd like to make three uh, brief acknowledgements as well. So first and foremost, I want to thank my colleagues, Sine Iseo and Paul Peterson, who have invited me to collaborate on this corpus of inscriptions of uh, Halicarnassos, and from whom I continue to, to learn so very much. This is a part of the, the Danish Halicarnassos project now also expanding a little bit to Canada. And it involves a very close collaboration with the, the Museum of Bodrum uh, in Turkey. So my research is, is devoted to writing the history of the, the city and as a foundation to that effort to study the inscriptions of the, the city of Halikarnassos. And I also want to acknowledge that this work is based on a, a wide variety of scholarship basically that is conducting a, a, a continuous study of the subject of Caria and the famous poem that we'll be talking about, the Samakis uh, poem has been studied extensively in, and, and one continues to receive much, much stimulus and inspiration from these kinds of studies. And finally, I would like to add briefly that I'm very privileged to conduct this work um, on this subject at Queen's University. And Queen's University is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. So this research very much acknowledges this and tries to develop the understanding of colonial interactions in a very different part of the uh, ancient world from um, my university, but nonetheless in, in relation and in dialogue with that. So let's begin. These men did not take women to their colony, but they seized local ones whose parents they murdered. And because of this killing, these women bound themselves together by oaths to upload a rule. And they passed this on to their daughters, never to dine at the same table with the men, nor call their husbands by name for the reason that they had slaughtered their fathers and their husbands and their children. And after having done their, these deeds, they lived with them in marriage. 
in its solution to a, a partial form of genocide, to forcible sexual exploitation, this is a story which could well be drawn out of almost any account of colonization. Yet some of you might recognize here the style of a man who's often claimed as the first historian, Herodotus. In fact, I confess that I've cheated a little bit on the previous slide and replaced one word in the passage, which is a marker of ethnic identity. The women in question, Herodotus tells us, were Carians. They belonged to a local Anatolian population established in the area of Southwest Asia Minor, Southwest Anatolia, Caria, speaking an Indo-Anatolian language. It's all too easy to note that this passage contains only a hint of brutality, that it's a gloss on very harsh realities, which one can presume or detect beneath the passage. Our historian is, is perhaps assuming the, the role of an early ethnographer in his early books. He's not really interested in the matter of colonization per se, much less in its attendant violence, but he's instead focusing on a peculiar custom or rule, this nomos that the women have. The women are essentially taking a partial vow of silence in relation to their husbands, their new husbands, and they're forsaking any commensality with them. This strikes Herodotus as a curiosity, uh, an anecdote worth recording, essentially, mostly for the entertainment of his audience. A post-colonial perspective on this passage would be entirely different and distinct, I think, emphasizing that what we have here is a poignant account of strategies for coping with trauma and for commemoration, which were employed by the female survivors of this forceful Greek colonization. And according to Herodotus, the men who arrived to form a colony here, originally from Athens, they founded a, a famous city on the western coast of Asia Minor called Miletos. And Miletos became one of the leading cities of Ionia, uh, Asia Minor, as you, as you know, sort of on the, the border between Caria and Ionia. And at least it certainly wished to present itself as a colony of Athens by the time of Herodotus. But the historical background of Herodotus's account is, is very difficult to evaluate, to say the least. The framework of the process of colonization, in many cases in Asia Minor, on the coast of Anatolia, resists our interpretation and often even that of archeologists. Without going into too many details here, we can note that there is a evidence for a Mycenaean settlement already at, at Miletos and, and various places in the area. And by the archaic and classical periods, we find a, a Greek and a Carian population coexisting to a degree in the city, notably evidence from personal names, from other uh, evidence of that sort. But how far back in history Herodotus's account of the forcible marriage of the Carian women by Greeks should be stretched is really a matter for conjecture. And it may only represent a particular construction of this past, but it surely reflects some darker truths about the meeting of the cultures that form the historical community that we can witness. And Herodotus presumably preserves a custom that's observable at least in some of the families, some of the Milesian families of his day. But my main case study comes from another part of Caria to the south, the city of Halicarnassos. It's about 50 or uh, 200 kilometers south of Miletos, depending on whether you travel by land or by, by ship. And surprisingly, we can note that Herodotus has little to say about the Carians in, in general, except for the some of the passage I, I quoted to you, a few other discussions. And he has even less to say about his native city, about Halicarnassos. On reflection, maybe this is not so surprising to a learned man who seems to have wished to present himself as an Ionian. He may even have read his work out in, in Athens. Caria was 
not only too close to home, it, it was home, basically. So my goal in talking to you today is to try to give a very brief overview of the landscape of this ancient city and to investigate the construction of its past to a degree, and particular to in particularly to use textual evidence to go about reconstructing stories of colonization, like the one we saw at Miletos. And much of what we noted about Miletos can also be said about Halicarnassos. So the principal account concerns a man who came from, from the city of, of Troizen, a figure called Anthes. There's also a link with, with Argos. But these are mythical links of kinship between uh, cities that may have been elaborated much after the fact. We should also note just before uh, beginning a, a little bit about the, the layout of Halicarnassos. So Vitru Vitruvius gives us a, a description of the city, describing it shaped like a, a theater, as you can see, facing out to sea. And he highlights in particular two promontories, two jutting ends that hopefully you can see at the bottom of the map, which he calls the, the sort of horns or the or the passages of the theater. And the one on the left is the promontory of um, San Marquis. And this account is, is substantiated also in earlier sources, such as by uh, Arian or, or Strabo, for instance, discussing the siege of Halicarnassos by Alexander in 334 BC. So San Marquis is, is one of the the promontories that's been included in, in this city by Vitruvius and his time and, and by earlier sources also. In, um, in, in 1990, rather, um, a, a remarkable inscription came to light in Halicarnassos, which confirms the identification of this promontory. And the, the text is carved on a large block, which is part of a, a retaining wall in very fragmentary rooms along the, the side of the cliff, basically, of the, of the promontory as it exists today. This wall belongs to one of many Hellenistic structures identified by the Danish Halicarnassos project. And it seems to have been part of a, a sanctuary, a series of, of partly preserved rooms that hosted various forms of, of receptions probably constructed in the in the Hellenistic period, as I said, and, and renovated also in the in the imperial period. So it's at the back of one of these rooms that the inscription stands on the on the face of the cliff, basically. And the, the rest of the sanctuary seems to have been mostly swallowed up by the by the sea. It's perhaps underwater and would be interesting to to uncover. So the poem that we're dealing with is an elegy comprised of, of 60 verses. And to the experts that immediately responded and, and started to analyze the poem, it shows influences from Miliger notably. It, the date has been suggested to be somewhat in somewhere in the late second or, or early first century BC, which is an impression that can be confirmed from the, the letters of the inscription when one looks at it. The poet of this work is unknown, but he's perhaps an erudite foreigner who was commissioned by Halicarnassus to compose a praise poem, which was then recorded in, in stone. And the poem basically offers a, a sweeping panorama of the past and the value of the, the city as it's constructed. So it's a comprehensive elaboration of the, of the past of the city. So I want to try to offer a, a very brief survey of it looking at a few distinct sections as, as succinctly as possible before returning to a, a deeper analysis of the passage concerning San Marquis. And there are various inscriptions which have been found in the ancient city, which can provide some useful comparison and shed a, a, some further light on the context and the meaning of the poem as a whole. So as you will have read, it begins, tell me, Squinitis Reedy, dear tamer of our cares, Kipris, you who brings close to us desires, scented with mirror, what is the part of honor of Halicarnassos? 
for I have never heard this. What words does she utter when she proudly boasts? So the poem invokes Aphrodite in seeking to answer this question posed in its preamble. What is honorable? What is the, the value of the city of Halicarnassos? And as a result, this inscription is usually known as the pride of Halicarnassos. And the voice of Aphrodite, as we can read, proceeds to give a series of answers, including this famous account of the story of Samakis and Halicarnassos. Aphrodite, as you can see here, is called both Skonitis and Kypris. The former epithet is a very unusual one, but it aptly situates the, the poem in its context. We're dealing with a, a marshy area, presumably um, connected with the, the spring at the fountain of Samakis at the side of the promontory. And the other name, Kypris, points to the origin of the goddess out to out to sea and to the island of, of Cyprus. So neither epithet is associated with a strict cultic denomination at Halicarnassos, but Kypris does recur in the early third century dedication of uh, a certain Phainos, as you can see here, dedication of a, of a statue to Aphrodite. And the epigram that's recorded on the stone makes it very clear that the goddess is addressed as a patron of seafaring merchants. Regrettably, the, the fine spot of this inscription is unknown, but it was first observed very close to this promontory of Samakis by the seaside. So there's a, a tentative connection which can be drawn with the cult of, of Aphrodite in this context. And regrettably, despite all the, the excavations that have taken place and the, the study of the promontory of Samakis, we still don't exactly know how the sanctuary of Aphrodite was, was configured um, through this. And there are still other inscriptions from the ancient city which can connect the goddess to, the, to this area, but I'll spare you those details. From Samakis to the, the harbor, we can move a little bit away from this Western promontory of Samakis to the center of the city. And through inscriptions, we could note that Aphrodite and Hermes were also worshipped in this area in the in the Agora of ancient Halicarnassos, notably. And this echoes the, tra the trajectory of the poem that we're analyzing. So Aphrodite is asked to speak on Halicarnassos' behalf, and the poem proceeds to move in a sort of trajectory into the past also as well into the further reaches of the city in spatial terms. And as you can read in the, the first section or elaboration of, of the poem, Halicarnassos is said to have brought forth a grand crop of earthborn men who sit beside mighty Zeus Acryos. And they first beneath the hollow ridge place the newborn child of Rhea Zeus fostering him in secret in the chamber of Gaia. So this is the, an allusion to the famous myth of the, the birth of Zeus. And as students of mythology, we of course tend to assume that Zeus was born on Mount Ida in Crete, but a, a casual acquaintance with the, the uh, travelogue of Pausanias can easily disabuse us of this notion. And Pausanias actually tells us that it was impossible to even begin to count the number of places in the Greek world that claimed to have seen the birth of Zeus and, and the raising of, of Zeus. And as we can see from this poem, Halicarnassos was no exception. There are two aspects maybe of this account that can particularly retain our attention. And the first is the location of this sanctuary of Zeus. It's on a, on a height, it's a Zeus Acryos. And the second is the role played by the earthborn men who assist Rhea during the birth and become the cult personnel of Zeus, essentially. So on the first matter, on the idea of the Zeus Acryos, there's an interesting block, perhaps a, an architectural member, which has been found described in letters, probably of the, the fourth century BC. It records the dedication of a men's dining room, an andron 
to Zeus and Cryos. The problem is that this block was reused in the walls of the medieval castle of the Knights of St. John that uh, stands on the other promontory of Halicarnassos, the one that you can see uh, to the east. So the fine spot of this block, because many blocks have come to this castle and been reused in it, is entirely unknown. And one way to interpret the epithet Acryos would be to uh, agree with this fine spot in a way and to think that Zeus was worshipped on this promontory of Halicarnassos uh, to the east, that this corresponds to the the Acry, the promontories of, of Halicarnassos. But there are several reasons why this might not be satisfactory. And to start with, the pride of Halicarnassos seems to imply that one could point to the purported birthplace of Zeus and that this was a cave under a mountainous ridge. So it would be much more appropriate to situate this sanctuary of Zeus on the heights north of the ancient city. We know there that there is a, a large terrace, which is usually identified as a temple of Mars or Ares on the basis of Vitruvius's description. Vitruvius speaks of a, of a temple of Ares in this location, but we know actually nothing about any worship of Ares at Halicarnassos. And we know that in Caria, Zeus often took a uh, warrior guys. So he was often called Stratios and worshipped as a, as a Zeus of the army with military implements and such like. And this terrace at the back of the city is really uh, impressive. It, it's of a similar size as the one of the mausoleum, so it's quite uh, large, and it's located very much at the, at the height of the, the city in the 4th century BC. So it's my guess that this sanctuary is actually the, the sanctuary of Zeus, at Halicarnassos. It does seem to be connected with a gorge in a, in a cave. So what of the assistance of Zeus? They derive from this stock of earthborn men who helped to conceive, to conceal the god and defend him uh, from Kronos. It's unclear what the reference might be. Scholars usually think of the, the model of, of Crete, so presume that these figures are, are curetes. Well, I would prefer perhaps to identify them with a group that's attested at uh, Halicarnassos, the Corribantes. So the figures that are twisting and turning as they're called. These figures are often found in connection with the cult of Gaia or the, the Phrygian mother. They're particularly associated with mystery rites, which the poem seems to allude to, calling these um, sons of earth or geones, uh, worshippers of of Zeus uh, and receiving various good things, which recalls the, the outcome usually expected of initiation. And so my reasoning also draws on, on inscriptions, in this case, on a late Hellenistic base for, for statues uh, now lost, but originally found not too far from what I presume to be the sanctuary of, of Zeus. And one of the honorans was a priestess of these Corribantes. But are we to read something else behind these earthborn men and their successors, the attendants of Zeus? So commentators have not failed to emphasize that the passage appears to identify a part of the population of Halicarnassos, which was descended from giants and which literally sprang from the earth. So in this line of interpretation, it's not tempting to see a veiled reference to the Carians, which is possible, but what's seems to be made in the poem to, to my sense is rather a claim about the autochthony of the Halicarnassians, regardless of the fact that the poem goes on to offer many different origins for the city. All of the origins are, are compatible to a degree. And this is a, a claim of Halicarnassians being literally sprung from the earth and protecting Zeus. So the next section moves on in mythical time and it focuses on the famous child of Aphrodite and Hermes, Hermaphroditos. So this is the passage we'll probably spend much of our time discussing. It's worth mentioning briefly the rest of this lengthy poem. So in the following verses, which are not reprised on the slide, there are three successive foundations of Halicarnassos, which are unveiled before our eyes. 
These interestingly involve many different locations, not only Troizen that I mentioned, but uh, a few others like Athens and, and Argos. There are also other carrying communities which are mentioned just outside of the city of Halicarnassos, places like Pedesa, probably Telnesos. So it's important to note that many communities in the area are envisaged as forming a part of this wider city. This, these considerations of, of further colonization and implantation of Greeks in Halicarnassos bring us also to a list of very illustrious historical figures, chief among which is Herodotus. And then there's a concluding coda on the internal continuation of the fame of the city and things of that sort. So let's come back to Hermaphroditos. This figure is called Our Boy by Aphrodite in the voice of the goddess, which is assumed by the, by the poet. And the myth of Hermaphroditos is presented in rather different terms from those found in other sources. Here, the figure of the nymph, Sanlakis, is assuming that of uh, the role of a, a nurse. Um, and this is quite parallel to what we find as the role of Ida in Ovid, rather than the role of Samakis, who's presented as, as a lover in, in Ovid. So it's clear that there were, um, these stories were very ancient, that there were different versions of the, of the myth of Samakis and Hermaphroditos. The most elaborate, perhaps the most famous, of course, is that of Ovid, who devotes a, over a hundred examiners of the fourth book of the Metamorphoses to it. Um, and you'll forgive me for condensing this very much, but uh, we, of course, hear the, that the, the fountain uh, San Maquis has this negative reputation that the, the figure of Hermaphroditos travels to this uh, spring and is um, seduced by the, by the nymph, essentially. So, so Samakis uh, engages in, in various arts of, of seduction of the, the figure and Hermaphroditos finally uh, dips into the pool, the nymph rushes to grab a hold of him and then um, come the, the famous passages where uh, Samakis tries to uh, prevent his escape, imploring the gods that the, that she may never be separated from uh, Hermaphroditos. And so the, the two figures are, are fused into one and Hermaphroditos also makes a, an invocation of his own that the spring um, be cursed and that um, any man who touches the water will, will go forth as a half man, will be weakened by the, the touch of the water. So the proclivities of the nymph Samakis and the compulsion she exerts on her prey ground a prayer that they become inseparable. And this is granted by the gods and leads Hermaphroditos in turn to pray that the water of the spring be cursed to render men effeminate. So we end where we began with an, an explanation of the infamy of the spring. In a text ant antedating Ovid's composition by perhaps a few decades, Vitruvius provides an interesting rejoinder to what he views as a widespread rumor and misconception about the nature of the spring of, uh, of Samakis. So he pauses on, the, on this Western promontory of Samakis to offer a, a digression. So it cannot be that the water makes men effeminate, he says, uh, and unchaste as it is said to do, for the spring is of a remarkable clearness and excellent in flavor. And he instead relates this to a story of colonization. So stating that the various colonists came from Argos and Troizen, drove out the Carians, a related people called the Leleges as barbarians. These people took refuge in the mountains or subject to the typical accusation of barbarians of, of raiding down from the mountains and attacking the Greeks. And finally, an innkeeper sets up a, a shop at the fountain. And this business attracts the, the barbarians in, in Vitruvius's account. And they were thus brought back of their own accord 
as he, as he writes, giving up their rough and savage ways for the delights of Greek customs. And hence this water acquired its particular reputation, he writes, because barbarians were softened by the charm of civilization. So in contrast with Ovid, Vitruvius presents us with a, a very pragmatic account, one that's rooted in this legend of colonization of Halicarnassos, the arrival of the colonists with variant uh, names, a conflict with the, the locals until an entrepreneurial colonist sets up this shop at the spring of Samakis, causing the indigenous people to abandon their rough and, and savage ways. So Hermaphroditos goes completely unmentioned in this story, you will, you will note. Uh, nor is he alluded to by, by Strabo, who also records this uh, opprobrium that's associated with the spring while not being able to offer any, any justification for it. So though a shared background is clear, we can reasonably ask whether these different emphases, apparently conflicting versions of the myth can be reconciled, the strongly negative portrayal of Ovid, the positive spin and rationalization of Vitruvius, and the local Halicarnassian version in the Pride of Halicarnassos inscription, and, and how we can go about this. So let's, let's first take a, a different tack very briefly. This praise poem, it's been recognized, can be used as a mirror for another important inscription from Halicarnassos, perhaps the oldest that's known. And this is the so-called convention of Halicarnassos and Salmakis and Ligdemis, which you see here now in the British Museum. From the script and from the mention of this tyrant Ligdemis who was ruling the city, we know that this should belong to the middle of the fifth century BC, or roughly speaking. This document contains a law concerning disputed property, but it reveals a Halicarnassos and a Samakis, which are at least superficially two distinct communities. But the inscription is very interesting also because it represents a concrete step in the political unification of these two communities. It's especially a phrase found near the conclusion of the inscription, which I've highlighted for you, which makes us pause. There is a a reference to the whole body of the, the Halicarnassians, the whole collectivity. So this essentially prefigures what will become even more formalized in later periods where an independent, a formerly independent community of Salmakis involving notably a carrying population will be integrated into Halicarnassos, a process known as, as Sunoikismos and the praise poem, the pride of Halicarnassos actually reflects to some degree this, um, this incorporation of different communities in, into the wider framework of the city of Halicarnassos. So in, in other words, this document reveals some of the historical background, what was happening on the ground, at least as far back as the beginning of the classical period, probably reaching back into the archaic period, if not earlier. So Samakis is a, is a carrying community and it's gradually being incorporated into Halicarnassos, a mostly Greek city. And so the myth of Samakis and Hermaphroditus can be recognized to have a concrete basis in several respects. It's a story of cultural interaction of a middle ground between the Greeks and the Carians. And many commentators have now affirmed this and they note that the Samakis myth is a form of Halicarnassus's of Halicarnassus's past and how it's constructed. So, the, and the poem itself specifically alludes to how Samakis was settled and became a part of this new Halicarnassus. As you can read, she, this is Halicarnassus, the city settled Nasamene in Greek, the height dear to the gods by the celebrated sweet stream of Samakis. And the last two verses in this quoted passage are very reminiscent of Vitruvius's account. Though, again, we are dealing with a poem which was anticipate this by several decades at least. So the waters of Samakis in this case don't transform the, the gender of the drinkers, but rather they pacify the savage minds of mortals as the passage reads. So this is 
a clearer echo of that version where Carians are meeting Greeks and the two become united culturally and, and politically. But to stop here, I think would be incomplete and tantamount to buying into Vitruvius's version only. The expressions of the myth in the Pride of Halicarnassos inscription and in Ovid's uh, poem concerning Hermaphroditos are still much more complex creatures and interconnected uh, together. The poem is unusual when compared to the version of in Ovid because it presents Salmachis as the nurse of Hermaphroditos rather than her first will, her first will uh, lover, as I mentioned. So the divine child Hermaphroditos is being matured and assuming the role of a, of a civilizing figure, a figure that's setting up institutions and most particularly, we read that Hermaphroditos is credited not with cursing the waters of the spring, as in Ovid, but with the invention of a human ritual, which must partly have taken place in the sanctuary, and which is also associated with Aphrodite, and this is marriage. So in the positive version of the local myth, myth and the cult, Samakis provides the setting for the rearing of Hermaphroditos, and the boy's competence is in binding sexual union to the law or custom of marriage. So the, the, this positive presentation of Halicarnassus's colonization is using marriage as a mechanism for legit legitimizing the interactions between different peoples, which is, was no doubt perpetuated in, in myth and cult at the site. But this is still a, a gloss on a much darker background, I think, one of violent sexual interactions and transformations like that of Ovid. So the passage here, as you'll note, tells us that Halicarnassos literally holds down Salmachis, the nymph. This is potentially a, a, an innocent verb, katecho in Greek. It can just mean to possess but it could also be interpreted as much stronger language. And one should also recall the fact that the, the savage minds of mortals need to be made gentle through this fountain and the institution of, of marriage, the institution of marriage symbolized by the water of the spring. In Ovid, of course, the, the myth of Salmachis is much more certainly rooted in, in sexual violence with a complex change of gender identity. And this also finds an expression in a popular Roman uh, phrase, which is attributed to the, the poet Ennius, you can see on the, the right here, cited by Cicero and Festus, according to, to these, Salmachitan spoils denoted a, a sexual conquest which was without sweat or blood. But clearly the inverse idea of violence and coercion was implicit in this phrase. So keeping all of these motifs in mind, it seems clear to me at least that they converge to eliminate, illuminate the more distant colonial past of Halicarnassos. So in, in other words, we've come back almost full circle to Herodotus' account of the colonization of Miletos here at Halicarnassos, we have Greeks imposing themselves on Carians, interacting with this local spring, manifestly forming unions, originally, it seems, forcible or violent ones, as is implied quite clearly by these stories. By the time of the pride of Halicarnassos' poem, perpetuating this tradition through the sanction of, of cult, so Aphrodite, Samachis, Hermaphroditos are all figures that gravitate around this polyvalent theme of mixing of Greek in Greek mixis, which can be le legitimized through marriage. But in the stories of Halicarnassos, this mixing is also inextricably associated with the related idea of mingling, not just in a in a sexual sense, but in a cultural one, at, at least. 
So refracted through all these different traditions is a construction of the past. And I think through it, we can start to witness a largely invisible archeology span revealing a middle ground between the, the Carians and the Greeks, which grew to dominate this area. And through this, I think also the, the legend and the history of how they can also more broadly offers a, a point of departure for an investigation into the construction of ethnic and sexual identities in the Mediterranean, which is something that we, we continue to wrestle with today. Thank you, Matt. Let me open this for our conversation okay. here. Um, okay, we're in gallery view now. Everyone is visible here. Um, who wants to go first? I have some questions, but I'll be polite and hold off for the moment. Or I won't. Um, I'll, I'll just jump right in. Um, Matt, there was um, yeah. a men's dining room that came up in, a, in an inscription that you showed to us earlier. And yeah. I wonder if you relate it in some way to the practice that you um, drew from Herodotus a bit earlier um, of the men being left to dine alone. Is this men's dining room a common institution? It is um, it in is the Greek common. world anyway, so yeah. it wouldn't be. It is so, yeah. Connected in this case. Yeah. I don't know if we can draw a strict uh, connection, but that's an interesting thought. Yeah. Um, no, but uh, Andrones men's dining rooms are are a very common uh, institution in in the in the Greek world, and uh, we find several monumental ones which are being built, notably in the period of uh, of Mausolus in Caria, which are associated with uh, with sanctuaries of Zeus, notably. There are some very famous ones at the sanctuary of Labranda uh, to the north of, of Halicarnassos. And uh, yeah, but the, the institution of dining was often a, a, a male exclusive one in the ancient Greek world, with the exception of, of the presence of, of female figures like courtesans, uh, notably, or uh, flute players, various musicians. Let's see. A question, why was Herodotus banished, I think? Yes, that's a question from Bill. Yeah. I, I got that impression somewhere in something I was reading. Yeah. No, it's, a, it's, it's very true. Uh, and it has to do with this. Uh, with this uh, Herodotus himself was not necessarily uh, banished, I think, but he, uh, he went into, into exile. And it had to do with this opposition through to the, the, the tyranny that was in place in, in Halicarnassus at the time, um, opposing various noble families of, of Halicarnassus, elite families with the figure of uh, Ligdemis. Thank you. I was also wondering about the epitaph that uh, is yeah. used for Aphrodite in the beginning. Um, is there any, any other reference to that why they chose that one and where it was from? It's very rare. Um, parallels have been collected for it, but they're, they're very few. And it doesn't seem to be an epithet that was used um, in cult per se. It seems like this may have been a, a, a choice of the, of the poet who was commissioned to, to write this, this work on, on Halicarnassus's behalf and Probably trying to to focus on the on the setting of the promontory of Samakis itself, with the spring and the reeds, um, playing up that that connection. Maybe it has something to do with the meter. <laughs> it, yes, it it may well as well. <laughs> of course, metrical considerations are always always important in this kind of thing. Thank you. Um, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Dan. Oh, thanks. Thank you for that, which was fascinating. I think I have a few ideas going around in my brain. I'm not sure how they all fit together. Okay. Um, the one thing that actually I was reminded of was Gilgamesh and the yeah. way Enkidu was civilized by having sex with the courtesan. 
Um, and it seems to me there's some kind of a connection here, and this is what I haven't got clear in my head, between colonialism and sexual conquest and marriage, which seems to legitimate the colonialism and the sexual context con conquest. Yeah, is that think, how you I, see I, it? Very, very much so. I think you, yeah, you put your your finger on it. Uh, that's that's very much what I see at play in the in this in this poem and in the this kind of nexus of stories concerning Halicarnassus uh, that we have. A, it's fascinating when yeah. you think that the importance of women is often diminished in the stories. And yet, and yet this seems to be very significant to me that, that the sexual relationship legitimates the colonialism. That's... Yeah. And it's interesting through these stories that we can, we can sort of make a, a different kind of archeology span in a way of, of this past, trying to, to bring back these stories into, into the discussion, trying to analyze these, these aspects of the narrative and, and bring back the, 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 the voice of these women, notably, who are, who are being uh, elided by, the, by the, uh, the, the reconstruction of the myth as a, a marriage, this le legitimating colonialism. Yeah, and there's all that business about various heroes traveling the Eastern Mediterranean looking for women all the time. Yeah. 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 Yes. It, okay. it, it has much broader ramifications than, yeah, than this, I was just thinking, this case study that I've that I've looked at, but you're you certainly right about you that. You could see it in, in a lot of others. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thanks yes, I very think much. I, I think this model would be generalizable to to many, many such narratives. Well, um, what Jason was doing, for example, in exactly. the story. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Food for thought. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sarah, you were going to go. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well then, uh, Jack, I saw you had your hand up there. Oh, hi. Thank you. Uh, I was, I'm curious, are you writing a history of the Carrions? I, I sort of was at, at one point, but uh, I, I think it's probably premature and too ambitious. But uh, now I focus more on, on, on the city of uh, Halicarnassus, notably working on the on the corpus of of inscriptions, but I, I think it, there very much remains the the scope for doing a, a journalized history of of Caria. I think that would be uh, a great uh, great scholarly work if it if it appears someday. I've always wondered about that proverb in Cari Kindinus, mm. uh, and you know they're very typically these the proverbs you know, get explained in the uh, yeah. paremiographers, uh, but this may be just whimsical explanations. Well, the, the, the Carians are much associated with, uh, with mercenaries as well. And a lot of these proverbs have to do with the fact that the, the, the Carians are also uh, roaming the Mediterranean in their, in their own right, uh, serving as mercenaries in, in places like Egypt, as we know. And uh, a lot of these proverbs start to start to coalesce around this, I think. And the, this, um, this warlike aspect of the, of the Carians is played up. If I may ask just one more, uh, am I remembering correctly that Alexander uh, installed a woman as the governess, the governor of, <coughs> of, um, Halicarnassus and the the surrounding yeah. area. Well, he yes, he defeated the the Persian satrap of of Caria, and there is a there is a story that he reinstated uh, Ada, the the sister wife of Idrius, one of the earlier satraps, so the uh, uh, younger sister of um, Mausolus, basically was probably quite advanced in age by the time of. Uh, Alexander, but was reinstated as the as the governor of the region. However, we don't really hear much about her impact as a as a ruler uh, under Alexander or anything of that uh, sort. I just, so we, I just wondered if that was an indication that he was re respecting the uh, I don't know, uh, uh, matriarchal uh, 
um, traditions of of the Carians? It's uh, it. I'm I'm not sure. I would call them uh, matri uh, matriarchal, but uh, there is definitely a desire by Alexander, if the account is is historical, to try to uh, legitimate his his rule with the with the Carians by re. Uh, instating one of the the earlier figures of authority in the region, um, and she more or less had been deprived of her power because of the death of her her husband. So um, I'm, I'm I'm not sure that he's really trying to to play to any matriarchal tradition necessarily. Um, that m may be extravagant. Uh, definitely, um, um, there there are honoring women yeah. women uh, tradition of the yeah. of uh, a lot of the uh, Anatolian peoples. Yes, there there are there are a lot of uh, matriarchal traditions that are associated with peoples of Anatolia, with the Lycians, for instance. Uh, so it. One could try to to make that argument, perhaps, but uh, I'm I'm not sure I would push it that that far. Uh, There's a question from Celia in the chat about where we should turn next for more reading on this this topic. Do you have any on, on, recommendations on, which topic? on on this topic in particular on Salakis? Well, or? Celia, perhaps you would like to clarify um, I was very interested by your comment uh, we can construct a new sort of archaeology or history through looking at these pieces of evidence through the lens of, of colon colonialism or at least so um, I was wondering where I could learn more about uh, <laughs> Don't know how to explain it. The looking at archaeology through uh, the lens of colonization, the lens of, of myth, or, or well, in in this particular case, there's a very good uh, article um, by Santini on the construction of of the past of um, of Halicarnassus represented through this through this poem that's uh, appeared and. Um, I'm, I can post a, some further reading if, if, that's, a, if that's relevant, uh, various uh, sources of that, of that kind. I'm, I'm not sure I can point necessarily to, uh, to a general work that would be uh, useful in this regard, but perhaps that just escapes me at the moment. Um, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Ellen? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, thank you. First, thank you very much, Matt, for the very fine presentation. Uh, I just have a general question about uh, Posenias. Posenias writes a lot about uh, different centuries and places. Uh, do we find more about Halicarnassus in Posenias? More information? Yeah, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of the Pausanias' discussion of Anatolia, we don't, we don't have that part of the, uh, the narrative very much. So we, we have oblique references in the, the description of Greece to places in, in Asia Minor of that sort, but we don't have, we don't have a, a, a travel log that uh, Pausanias would have provided amongst all the, all the different sanctuaries of Asia Minor. So no is the short answer, I'm sorry, but. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Anyone? We're missing a lot of that. Uh, Can I just ask a final question? Yes. Uh, I don't know if I might have missed this in your uh, talk, but do we have any actual, do we have any sources from the Carians themselves uh, about the experience 
they went through in Halicarnassus? The problem with the, I didn't really talk about this, or you're right that, um, but the, again, the answer is unfortunately a, a mostly negative one um, in terms of evidence. We do have evidence for uh, carrying inscriptions and the carrying language. We know a lot about carrying names. There, are, uh, there has been a, a considerable effort in the past decades to decipher the carrying language, which is attested through very few inscriptions from Kerry itself. There are actually more inscriptions of these Kerryan uh, mercenaries and, and other Kerryan uh, immigrants to Egypt, uh, which have allowed the, the decipherment of, of the Kerryan language to, to progress. But we don't have uh, access to any Kerryan accounts of, of colonization or, or Kerryan myths or literature of, of any sort at the moment. If, if they existed. So again, our, our picture is very much uh, partial to the to the Greek view. Um, I, I have a question uh, about the assimilation process. So this marriage, uh, through marriage, they are assimilated, the Carians are assimilated, and the offsprings are citizens of uh, which part of the world? Are they going to be Greeks or um, Carians? It's a very, it's a very complex uh, historical question, basically. What I was trying to do with this this poem and this narrative is to take us even into into prehistory, essentially, because we don't we don't really have the the evidence for you know, Carians interacting with with Greeks. One once we have inscriptions and historical accounts like Herodotus or the inscription I I showed one of the earliest ones. We can see that the communities of, of Halikarnassos and, and Samakis are already integrated to some degree. The people from Samakis have more carrying names, let's say, as a general rule, and, and the people from Halikarnassos have more Greek names, but the, the, the process of acculturation has already started to happen in, in many respects. So it's very difficult to, to answer your question in, in historical terms, at least. What we can see is that through this incorporation politically of Samakis into Halikarnassos, that the inhabitants will have become um, citizens of, of the city of Halikarnassos, presumably. And we can presume through this development of a myth and cult in the, in the promontory of Samakis that there was a, a process through which um, these marriages happened and that the communities eventually became very closely associated. So I don't, I don't know if that answers your, your question, but it's the, again, the answer is we don't, we don't really know in, in concrete historical terms, but we can, we can open up these perspectives through, through the, the stories. Thank you. At that point, I find it interesting that the civilizing spring is located in the Carrion. Uh, it's, it's in San Laquis. Yeah. Right. Um, that was identified. It's civilizing effects are identified with the Greek customs, let's say. And with this, you know, Vitruvius's idea of the, of the shopkeeper that, uh, that sets up his, uh, his business there or very much trying to appropriate this, this kind of, uh, this cult site as a, a place where barbarians so-called are going to become uh, more, more civilized, yeah. Let's see. Um... Here's a question in the chat from Jack. Thucydides writes about carrions in the archaeology book one. Um, let's see, 
uh, burials in the Aegean Islands in the style of Carian burials? What do we know about Carian burials? Uh, we don't know uh, that much, at least to to my knowledge. But I'm not a I'm not an expert in in Fury archaeology of the of the area. But um, I know that that passage in in Thucydides is is quite a a controversial one, and that it's been it's it's relating to the the burials that were uh, I think removed from the island of of Delos, isn't it? Um, that through the purification of the the island of Delos, so it's it's part of a, a another nexus of myths, let's say, where Carians had settled in in various places in the in the Aegean, and now the when when the island is is purified in in Delos, the the burials are are removed and are are thought to have characteristics which identify them as as being different from what the Greeks uh, expected, perhaps in terms of the, the, the weapons or the armor uh, buried along with the, with the figures. And uh, this would have led to a kind of rationalization that these burials were, belonged to, to Carians. In, in terms of the archeology span of uh, Caria itself, we know that there were various distinct traditions in terms of of burial in, in Caria. We often find uh, different types of, of tombs in Anatolia, notably. Uh, rock cut tombs, for instance, are particularly associated with this area of, uh, of southwestern Anatolia. Um, it, it's not clear to me that the, that the forms of burial necessarily are, are different or that there's necessarily a focus on on cremation versus inhumation or, th or distinctions of that sort. I don't know if that answers your question again, but hopefully it. Yeah, I see Jack shaking his head, yes. Okay. So um, I have my eye on the time, so I think we should call it here, but I just wanna thank you again, Matt, for this thank you. presentation and, and conversation that you've offered to us. And thanks to those of you who joined us here in the in the Zoom, and thanks to all of you out there who are watching.